One of the biggest discoveries of the Voyager mission in the 1970s and 1980s was the realization that volcanoes exist on numerous planets and moons across the solar system. From active lava spewing formations to frozen ice volcanoes and ancient volcanic remnants, these fascinating features are ubiquitous in our cosmic neighborhood. This episode, I spoke to geologist and cosmochemist Dr. Natalie Starkey to find out more about the volcanoes erupting fire and ice throughout the solar system. So I'm Dr. Natalie Starkey. Um, I'm currently a public engagement officer for physics at the Open University, and I'm also a popular science book writer. I've written two books now, and my second book is Fire and Ice, um, which is about the volcanoes of the solar system. Great, yeah. Um, thanks very much for joining us on the podcast today, Natalie, and for, for speaking to me. Um, yeah, as you say, uh, your latest book is, is Fire and Ice, and it's, I think it's going to be coming out um, around about the time that the podcast released. Um, and yeah, that's sort of the, our, our topic of discussion today is the volcanoes of the solar system. I did think it was worth at the start, maybe sort of um, just just going going back to basics and just getting that sort of um, definition. What, what actually what actually is a volcano? What, what's going on under, underneath the surface to cause a volcano to happen and what ultimately is going on? Yeah, that's a great question and also not a very easy one to answer, weirdly, um, because it sort of depends where you look. So um, because we live on Earth, all everything that we know about is skewed towards stuff that happens on Earth. So when we look at our own planet, we have plate tectonics, as most people know. And this creates a huge variety of volcanoes and, and earthquake events and a huge variety of geology that we see on the surface, which is great because it keeps our planet really interesting. It also shows our planet's alive inside, it's warm and it's still active. Um, but that produces volcanoes and things that we wouldn't see anywhere else. Um, and we also then have a whole other type of volcano, which comes from what we call mantle plumes that come from, from the deep interior of the Earth. So what we see is in, in any of these cases, what we're looking at is, is magma rising to the surface. Um, so magma just being molten rock, um, rising to the surface and erupting. Now, it can erupt as, as molten flows like you see in Hawaii, like basalt flowing, um, or it can be much more explosive, like we see somewhere like Mount Fuji in Japan. But whatever happens, we're basically talking about exploded or molten rock. Um, and that pretty much is a volcano. In terms of what it looks like on the surface, there's a whole variety of stuff. So I tend to, whenever I think of a volcano, in my head, I've got, you know, a nice conical mountain with maybe a snow-capped peak at the top um, that has a fire erupting out the top. Um, you know, that very classic kind of picture of volcano. But the problem is when we go out into the solar system and we want to look at volcanoes elsewhere, um, this very simple picture about how they look doesn't really work any longer because we don't think there's plate tectonics anywhere else. We haven't yet found it anywhere else in the solar system. So we don't tend to get those really steep sided volcanoes like we get here because you need plate tectonics to create them. But what we do see is volcanoes that are a bit more like the ones we have in places like Hawaii, what we call these mantle plume or hotspot volcanoes. So basically, it's a really hard question to answer because then it's not just about rocky material. We also have volcanoes in the solar system that are made of ice. So it's, yeah, not an easy one to answer. When we started to investigate the solar system in more detail, what we found is that it's become even harder to answer. Um, so actually, it's something scientists are still deciding upon how to best define what a volcano is. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right in thinking that you um, came to the volcanoes of the, the solar system via volcanoes on Earth? You, you've, you sort of travelled the world looking at um, volcanoes around around the world, haven't you? How, where where has, has have those journeys taken you and how did you decide to sort of look at volcanoes beyond Earth? Yeah, so I've always been fascinated by volcanoes. Um, when I was studying for my A-levels, um, I read this book about a volcano in Colombia called Galeras, which this um, scientist and a group of scientists have been up and, and been involved in a volcanic eruption at the summit. Um, the book was quite controversial because the scientist that wrote it was actually the person that led the team up there to, to study the volcano and, and possibly should have known there were signs this volcano was going to erupt and potentially took them into danger when he shouldn't have. So that's why it's controversial. But actually, you know, he suffered um, life-changing injuries during this eruption, um, which was awful. But for some reason, um, this, this story really inspired me. And I don't consider myself a particularly risk-taking person, but um, I really just loved the idea of studying these, these volcanoes. So that led me to, um, you know, 
continuing geology to learn more about these objects. And then um, from there, I started looking more at volcanoes in places like the Caribbean. So this is one of these very explosive volcanoes um, in a small island. I worked over there for for a few months learning all about kind of an active volcano. And I've also worked in Iceland, um, which is a a different type of volcano, more like the ones we see in Hawaii. Um, But again, uh, not quite as dangerous, I would say, because not not active at the time I was there. Um, But from there, I actually... In a roundabout way, um, started studying space rocks. So from when I finished my PhD, I went to look at comet and asteroid samples. So I was analysing the geochemistry of them, which was very similar to what I was doing on the geochemistry of the volcanic rocks. It's all elements. I'm studying the same kind of things, but it was just either a volcanic rock or a rock from space. It didn't matter much. So I kind of, with this book, put all of these loves together and just melded it all and thought, well, I'm fascinated by volcanoes. I've never studied specifically volcanoes in space, but I know a lot about space. And I thought this would be a great book to write. Um, First of all, because there weren't any, really any books on space volcanoes out there. And it's a really emerging field at the moment as we're going out and discovering more about, um, you know, all these different places in the solar system where there's activity where we didn't expect it. Yeah, no, I, I, as we do sort of venture further out and, and begin to study those um, volcanoes beyond Earth, do we constantly sort of look back to the volcanoes that we know about Earth? How, how do Earth's volcanoes inform our, our studies of um, volcanoes on other planets and moons? Yeah, it's a bit of back and forth, actually. So there's this whole area of um, planetary science called comparative planetology. So this is where we sort of look to other places to learn about our own world and then use our own world to look at other places. So whilst you can take, you know, there might be a moon around Jupiter that's much smaller than Earth, but it might have some features that look very similar to the volcanoes we have on Earth. So we can use our own natural laboratory here to then learn about what's going on over there and vice versa. Because actually, if we go into space, sometimes things are a bit simpler um, because they don't have plate tectonics to complicate things. Um, So actually, we can look at Io, a moon of of Jupiter, which has rocky volcanoes erupting. It's the most active body in the solar system. We can use that to learn about actually Earth's history because the types of volcanoes it has there today are ones that we had billions of years ago on Earth that we no longer really have um, happening at at the present day. So, yeah, the, we, it, it's a bit of both. We can kind of use them both ways. You mentioned um, in, in the book, you, you talk about the uh, Voyager missions um, quite a lot. And you, you mentioned Io there. I mean, you know, um, Voyager really gave us our first glimpse of so many different worlds and of the solar system. And Io in particular, didn't it? It was, it was re- really the Voyager missions that sort of worked out that Io was, was so volcanic. Yeah, completely. I mean, without the Voyager missions, we would not know so much as we do today. And I, I'm just, they were happening while I was growing up. And I guess I wasn't particularly aware of it. I guess it just seemed normal for me that, you know, we, we were discovering this stuff about the outer solar system. But um, we just wouldn't have known that there was so much activity out there if we hadn't sent that mission out or both those missions to go and explore out all the way to the outer solar system. Um, Io was one of them. And actually, it's so we've still got tons of data left over from the Voyager missions, which we've been able to kind of go back and look at. And future missions that have gone to IO have spotted things, and then they've gone back and looked at the old data from Voyager and seen the same features, which they hadn't been able to spot back in the earlier data because it was too grainy or they had to just process it a bit more. But what we've seen is that loads of eruptions have happened. So this is why we know IO is so active. In fact, Voyager saw nine eruptions happening between the two missions, Voyager 1 and 2, that went by. Nine eruptions actually happening in it during those flybys, which is incredible. And then obviously New Horizons has been by and, and other missions have been there. And we've now got all this incredible detail about the surface of Io and the fact that it's just covered in volcanoes. And we see plumes erupting off the surface. We can see changes on the surface from one mission to another. So you'll see a lava flow appear on the surface that wasn't there before. So it's happening right now. And it's just in- so incredible that we've been able to go out there and see that in like, you know, my lifetime. That's the kind of time that we've learned this stuff about all of these planets and moons around us. Definitely. And it, it makes you think about, um, you know, the uh, three other um, so-called Galilean moons around um, Jupiter. So they're like the Jupiter's four largest moons, Io being one of them. And the others are these sort of um, icy, sort of rocky bodies. Um, why? Why is Io in particular not an, not a sort of a frozen icy body? Why is it so so volcanic? <laughs> 
So yeah, they so basically all of these moons tend to have a rocky interior. So that's pretty normal with any of the moons that we see out in the outer solar system. But their surfaces tend to be icy or what we would say, we sometimes call them ocean worlds. So some places like Europa and Enceladus, we call ocean worlds because under this kind of ice cap surface, they've got huge oceans of salty water, which we've also discovered, you know, within the last kind of 40 years. That's quite recent stuff. Um, so, but Io is completely different. It's it's all rock. Um, and the reason it's kept warm, because it should be pretty much frozen, you know, it should definitely have a frozen surface this far from the sun. Um, it's sort of caught in this tug of war between Jupiter, which is obviously this enormous planet with a huge amount of gravity, um, this tug of war between Jupiter and, and its uh, other moons that surround it. So it's kind of pulled back and forth as it goes around its orbit. And what happens is the inside, all the rocks inside Io are sort of ground and squished against each other and pulled, um, creating friction, which literally melts the rock, creating heat and melting the rock um, to produce all the volcanoes at the surface. So um, if, you know, if you moved Io to probably, uh, if it was a moon around Earth, it wouldn't be active. It would be like our moon. It would probably be cold and dead because it doesn't didn't have that kind of gravitational influence to, to pull it apart and, and melt it. So all of these worlds are fascinating. Um, and in terms of the, the icy ones next to Io, they're fascinating in their own right because they are still active worlds, but they're made of ice. Um, and so that's, you know, it's weird to have two completely different worlds next to each other surrounding Jupiter, which is obviously a fascinating planet in its own right. Yeah, indeed. And I was reading actually, um, because the uh, Juno mission at Jupiter, I think was due to end in August 2021, which at the time recording is next month. But NASA has extended the mission. And apparently one of the things it's going to be doing is taking a closer look at at the Galilean moons and in particular, a sort of uh, IO flyby. I mean, you must be pretty excited about that. Yeah, I mean, that. luckily, there's so much going on and there's future missions planned um, to that system because there's so much more we need to learn. There's just so much going on there. There's so many moons and they're all so different. But what we've learned about them is that when we take a brief look at their surfaces, we know they're not dead. So what we would usually consider as a dead world if we go into the solar system would be something that's covered in craters like our moon. So if you're covered in craters, it means you've been hit and bombarded by comets and asteroids over history, and you've not been able to cover over the evidence of those impacts. So if we look at Earth, we're geologically interesting, but we have hardly any craters because our world is always changing its surface with plate tectonics. And you've got to remember this happens over geological timescales. I'm used to thinking in kind of millions and billions of years. And so you kind of have to move your brain to go, oh, yes, we're not thinking in kind of human lifetimes. So impacts occur in space all the time. And the rate at which they've occurred doesn't really change over time. So if you see a world that isn't covered in craters, then you know it must have been active relatively recently, geologically speaking. And all of them are. Ganymede and Europa and Enceladus and all these different moons um, have really cool surfaces. They could have smooth planes and they can have, you know, weird pop, well, kind of like, well, the, one of them you, you see, um, you know, these different terrains that definitely look like geological activity is happening. Stuff is rising up or you've got mountains been forming. So there's stuff going on there, which shows you the inside of that world is somehow creating heat in some way. And the way they do that is all different. That's so cool. You uh, mentioned um, the moon there as sort of being, you know, lifeless and dead and, and, and cratered. Um, but it wasn't always like that, was it? Um, what, do we, what do we know about our own moon's vol- volcanic history? Yeah, so we're pretty certain the moon formed from the Earth itself during a huge impact very early on in in Earth history with a Mars-sized object, which sort of basically threw off the moon in in that process, so to speak. Um, So the the moon is very similar to the Earth, but it's a lot smaller. And actually, when you go out into the solar system, size is everything. So if you've got a massive planet, it tends to be able to create its own heat or has preserved heat from its formation. It also has a lot of radioactive elements in its mantle because it's made of silicate rock, which has a lot of radioactive elements within it, which creates heat over time. So somewhere like the Earth has been able to stay warm over time. Whereas if you get a small world like the moon, um, it's it's got fewer of those radioactive elements. So it's lost that heat over time. So generally, we know that the moon died off, let's say, quite a few billion years ago. There may have been little spurts of activity, um, but mostly it 
ended about 3 billion years ago. Now, the moon is then contracting. So it could be that. We're not sure. We think within the moon, there could still be molten areas. But we don't think there's going to be, you know, big eruptions in the future. There could be a spurt of lava that comes out of the surface at some point in the future with the moon because it's still contracting. But basically, as it contracts, it kind of closes up all those cracks where lava could escape. So it becomes harder and harder and it just then cools down and sort of dies. But over its history, it has been active. It had, and it's taught us a lot about our own planet at, at the same time, because we've been able to look at different terrains on the moon and learn about our early history, which has all been lost on Earth because of plate tectonics. So again, it's that comparative planetology looking out around us to learn about our own our own Earth. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned the, the moon's size there. Um, could could a body, is a body too small to be uh, to, to be volcanic, you know. Can it, can a body be too small to be to be volcanic, or you know, could you could you get volcanoes on, on asteroids, for example? Yeah, so we used to think actually, yeah, the smaller bodies would definitely be cold and dead and frozen in time. But it, it's not the case because you know we take Io; it's only a little bit bigger than the Moon, and it's still hugely active. So, while size is important, um, it then also depends where you are in the solar system and what your history has been. So, for Io, obviously, being next to Jupiter is important. Um, but if we take the tiny objects in the solar system, the, the asteroids, for example, well, Ceres, which is um, one of it's the biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt, so it is quite large, and it is large enough to have become round. It's not kind of a random shaped object, um, so it, it is a, quite a large object. But it has, we think, been active over the time since it formed. So over the kind of four and a half billion years since it formed, it's continued to be active because we see evidence for cryovolcanoes, so ice volcanoes, on its surface. Which so it, it is a very cold object. Um, we think it these volcanoes actually erupt some sort of briny solution, like a salty, um, kind of thick, sludgy solution that comes out. Um, but yeah, basically it's been active all that time. So it it's been heated up somehow. We're not exactly sure where it's got its heat from. That's the weird thing. But in some way, it could have been from impacts. So if you get an impact, all that kinetic energy has to go somewhere and it turns to heat, and that could melt some of the interior of Ceres and create these volcanoes. But at the same time, the other end of the scale, if we go to the really rocky um, objects, so there's, for example, a, an asteroid called Psyche, where there's a mission going called, um, the, the Psyche mission is actually going to go to it. Um, and it's, well, they think it's made of iron and they think it could have erupted iron volcanoes in the past. So the iron actually comes from, it's basically like the interior of a world. So if you have a, a large enough object in the solar system, like Earth or Mercury or Venus or Mars, it's segregated into different layers. So the middle of that, that world is going to be um, iron and heavy metals. And then outside of that, you'll get the lighter materials, the silicate mantle, so the rocky material, and then your atmosphere outside of that, if it's got one. So what they think might have happened with Psyche is that um, these uh, the, the iron inside got insulated by the silicate mantle and, and stayed molten, and then actually could have erupted as volcanoes, because what they're seeing is that Psyche isn't quite the right density to be all iron. They see iron on the surface, but when they measure the density of it, it's too dense to be all iron. They think it must have silicate underneath that iron. So how did that silicate get to the surface? So this NASA mission will go there and it will be trying to answer all these questions. It will teach us loads about how we get, you know, iron volcanoes on tiny little objects out there. And it's not very large either. So that basically you can have whatever you want. I, I think, you know, there's volcanoes everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it. It is really, really interesting to consider that, and that must that must have been, you know, mind blowing from a geological perspective when we started to know that there were things like cryovolcanoes, like ice volcanoes. That must like was, was that just mind blowing as as a geologist? Yeah, and I think it took a lot for some people to really accept that they were volcanoes because when, for example, you, you, you know, plumes were seen erupting from Enceladus, and it was argued, well, are they geysers like we see on Earth that? are not volcanic in nature. They're, they're not volcanic in origin, but they are related to the fact that there's heat under the surface and, and you know, waters are heated up and pushed out again. But actually with Enceladus, um, what you're seeing is actually the interior of that moon erupting out. So it's not the same as a geyser. It's a proper volcanic plume because just where our, our interior is made of rock, um, Enceladus's interior is made of, you know, a salty ocean. So that's what we see come out of the plume. And it brings out everything from the interior of that world. So 
it is volcanic in origin. It just doesn't look like a volcano like we see on Earth. Um, and we see the same kind of thing on Pluto. When we got to Pluto and we saw that it wasn't this cratered object which we expected in the outer solar system. It was this active world that was alive, but it was freezing cold. Um, but we see, you know, plains, smooth plains of ice, which are just like massive glaciers on Earth. And, you know, all these things that are happening there which show that stuff is moving around on its surface. Yeah, it sort of makes me think. It just it's funny that you were, you were you mentioned Pluto there because when you were saying about um, you know there being maybe like a bit of a debate about whether or not the Enceladus plumes count as a volcano, it almost it seems like they are what it's sort of like what happened to Pluto in two thousand and six. You know, as more Kuiper Belt objects were discovered, we had to redefine what a planet is. So have, yeah. have the sort of cryovolcanoes and plumes made geologists have to redefine what a what a volcano is? Yeah, completely. Because as I said, we're sort of skewed towards what we see on Earth. Um, and Earth might be the weird one. I kind of made this point in the book. We, we focus everything on our own planet. But what if we're the weird one? What if everything else around us is the more normal stuff? And obviously, we don't know because we haven't sampled that many objects. We know our solar system fairly well. But even when we go outside of our solar system, there's so many more stars and planets and moons out there that we haven't been able to study. So maybe all these cryovolcanoes are much more common in, in the universe. And actually, the type like we have with plate tectonics is, could be very unusual. Who knows? But that's the problem we have. So I think we are now moving towards, you know, cryovolcanoes are completely accepted in literature. People talk about them all the time. Um, and it's just kind of shifting our focus to kind of frozen worlds, of, you know, rather than these hot worlds that, that melt rock. Yeah. Um, we, we definitely can't um, pass up a conversation about volcanoes of the solar system without talking about Mars. Um, because, I mean, it, it seems to be the planet that we know so much, that we know most about its, its history and we've, we've sort of studied the most and we study it, you know, in terms of its, whether or not it had water and, and all this uh, sort of stuff and its geology. Um, what, do we, what do we know about um, Mars's volcanic history? Yeah, I think one of the reasons we're so fascinated by Mars, one, because it's close to us, so we can get to it fairly easily. And we have sent a lot of um, spacecraft there to, to study it. But also, we think it was very similar to Earth today, but billions of years ago, we think it did have water on its surface. Um, Earth is the only place in the solar system to have liquid water at its surface at the present day. So to find another place that had that in the past makes us think, well, did it also have life? Because these are the things that make Earth a bit different to these places. So we're pretty sure it did. So there's every chance that if life started on Earth, it could also have started on Mars, but it almost certainly would have died away with the water disappearing. Um, but the great thing about Mars is that it's also got the largest volcano in the solar system, which for us is just very exciting because it's got this enormous volcano called Olympus Mons, bigger than Mount Everest. Um, and But the weird thing about that volcano is that it's very similar to the ones we see in Hawaii. But the difference is that Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. So what happens is this plume of molten rock was rising through um, the interior of Mars and got to the surface and started erupting out this volcano and just carried on doing that for a billion years or more. Whereas on Earth, we have the same thing happening, but our surface moves over that stationary plume in, in, in the Earth over time. So we get a trail of volcanoes. So the volcanoes are still large, like Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa and Hawaii are absolutely enormous, but they're nowhere near as big as the ones on Mars because basically the plate um, that the volcanoes sit on on the surface is moving away from that that volcanic centre over time. So you get that nice chain of beautiful islands. I absolutely love Hawaii. Um, but yes, that's the difference. So, you know, we would never be able to get uh, a volcano as big as Olympus Mons on Earth. Basically, it would collapse under its own weight anyway because we've got more gravity. But, um, but it's fascinating that we can then study that and then find out about if it's different, how it's different to the ones that we have here. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Really fascinating. Um, what, about, what about the inner planets though, actually? Because... We, when people talk about volcanoes, we're sort of we are focused on the outer planets, aren't we? And they're sort of icy moons. Um, pr presumably, Mercury doesn't have any active volcanoes to this day. But what, what about Venus? So yeah, Mercury's probably you know again, it's a bit like the Moon. It's very small. Um, it's it's um, basically been extinct for about since three and a half billion years ago. So not much going on. It, it does probably still have a molten interior weirdly, but then it's contracting a lot and that, that molten material can't then escape. So we think Mercury is pretty much dead, but it's still a really interesting planet to study, um, just incredibly hard to study because it's proximity to the sun as well. 
Um, But Venus, oh my goodness, I think we're going to have a bit of a Venus moment over the next few decades because we've got three or four missions now um, going to Venus um, pretty soon. Uh, I don't know how that's all happened at once. Suddenly NASA and ESA, and I think there's an Indian mission as well, all going there. And we've got mostly orbiters, but I think the NASA missions are going to be dropping things to the surface. It's incredibly hard to study Venus because it's got an awful environment. Um, Basically, the surface is 450 degrees Celsius. It's got a hugely um, crushing pressure on the surface. So if you send any spacecraft down, it's going to survive a matter of hours before it dies. And we have, uh, the Soviets did that years ago with some, some missions. I think they lasted a couple of hours. So you can't learn much about Venus from being on the surface, but you can learn stuff as you go down to the surface through its very dense atmosphere, of mostly carbon dioxide. But when we study it from the outside with orbiters, and if you use radar, you can actually see through that haze of atmosphere and see the surface in detail, which is what we're going to be doing, kind of mapping out the geology of the surface, finding out what the rocks are made of, um, and, and maybe even seeing a volcano erupt. We've never seen one erupt, but when you look at the surface, it's extremely volcanic, um, and it pretty much is all the same age. It's about 500 million years old, the surface, which sounds really old again, but if we put our geological hats on, we go, oh no, hold on, that's that's not very old in geological timescales. Um, so something caused Venus to have huge flood basalt eruptions um, all at this, within a really short time scale, about you know, 500 million years ago. We need an explanation for that. We don't know why that happened. Uh, we have ideas of why it happened, but studying it more and finding out more about those rocks will tell us more about its volcanoes. So It has, I think, the most volcanoes of any object in the solar system, but we just need to learn more about them. And I think probably it is still active, but I think that's what we're kind of heading towards. We're pretty sure it's still active, um, but we've just never seen a volcano erupt there. So this is something that's definitely going to come out in the next few decades. There's, I mean, there's obviously so much that, you know, um, geologists know about volcanoes in the solar system and obviously so much left to learn. And it sort of got me thinking about how much the field of um, astrobiology has um, sort of erupted over the past few years with the search of light, search for life. Um, is is astrogeology a thing? Does does, does that term exist? Uh, well, I guess yeah, yes, in a way, yeah, it's a part of everything, really. Um, but the astrobiology is is really interesting because that's kind of melding everything together. Of course, we are the only example of life that we know of in in the universe, so. If we want to look elsewhere, we've got to start thinking about the weirder parts of our planet where life exists, because that's going to be more comparable to the weird alien environments that we see on Europa, for example. So one of the places we focus the search in terms of astrobiology is actually the depths of our oceans, because down there, there's no light. Um, Life exists on a completely different kind of um, thing set up to, to humans and biology on the surface of the Earth. But it seems like a really extreme environment to us, but these bugs and animals can survive down there, you know, with no light. They basically don't rely on sunlight to survive, which we just doesn't work for us in our heads, but it it works for them. So when we go to these places like Europa, where we think there could potentially be life way under those ice capped surfaces um, existing in, you know, the depths of the oceans, Basically, they've got all the ingredients the same as we have at our mid-ocean ridges, but um, it's just in an icy ocean. So they're the places we're kind of looking at. We've got to look at these weird environments on Earth to understand where the possibilities for life might be in the outer solar system. Do you think that that, 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 that search for life is, is potentially um, overlooking a body like uh, Io? Like, would, would, would you like to see um, a, a robotic spacecraft just solely focused on Io and and its volcanic activity? Of course, but I don't think we're going to find life there. So I think if we're focusing the search for life, it's going to be on these icy ocean worlds um, because we think water is one of the key ingredients and and liquid water, it's got to probably be liquid water at that because you need to be able to move biology around. Stuff needs to be able to happen. So whilst, yes, I would love a dedicated mission to IO because it's just going to be basically beautiful images that are going to come back and we'll get videos of, you know, volcanoes erupting. I think it's very unlikely that life exists there because it's pretty much like Earth was four billion years ago, when, you know, before probably life even started on Earth. So it's interesting for that region, maybe figuring out how Io could turn into an Earth in the future. But I think it's unlikely in its position in the solar system. But but yeah, why not? Let's send a mission there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was also um, reading um, about a year or two ago about a, a, a potential mission, at least, called uh, 
Trident that's going to be sending a, a mission to Neptune's moon Trident. And isn't that sort of where this all began? Wasn't that the mm. sort of the first the first cryovolcano or plume that 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 we discovered? Yeah, and that was one of the biggest surprises. So I think it wasn't until the late 80s that, um, yeah, the Voyager mission saw um, Triton. Uh, and and it was a really big surprise because, you know, we just had no, no inkling that out there, way out in the solar system, there would be an active world. And what they saw, again, was an uncreated surface. But I don't know, if you go and Google images of Triton, it's absolutely fascinating. There's so much geology going on. Um, and you've got, they also saw these kind of plumes. It looks like but they're called kind of wind streaks. Um, so they looked like there's little smoke, smoke plumes going across the surface and the wind is carrying them away. So there's something going on inside. It's active. Um, we don't 100% understand why. We think uh, Triton was... Uh, kind of a captured moon. Um, it was probably started out in the Kuiper Belt, a bit like Pluto. Um, it probably had a binary moon with it that got thrown off at some point, and it was captured into Neptune's orbit. And this probably created its current heat uh, because it was caught in this kind of elliptical orbit and being pulled around by, by Neptune's gravity, creating heat inside it, just like we see at Jupiter with Io. And today it's still active. And so we see this ice, all these ice volcanoes, these ice stuff going on. So it's a fascinating place. We definitely need to go back there. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, and the geology, the ice geology will be fascinating. So yeah, I can't wait. I want that one to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it does also make you think, um, as you said, you know, we used to think of these these outer solar system bodies. We've always assumed at least that they were sort of lifeless and cold. Um, but now we know that's not the case. It, it does sort of make you think what of the all the different geological and volcanic processes that are happening on other exoplanets and exomoons, it, it must just be just completely ubiquitous across the universe or across the galaxy, mustn't it? Yeah, I think so. And, and we have seen, um, we've definitely found a lot of rocky worlds as exoplanets around other stars. And we think we've even found um, a moon like Io around an exoplanet. So um, it, it's incredibly hard to spot these things. So exoplanets are hard to spot to start with. And then being able to spot a moon around an exoplanet is even harder. But it, it is being done. And that's sort of what we're pushing the technology of our telescopes and, and the scientists that can analyse these kinds of data. Um, but we are seeing that. So you know, finding an Earth-like world might not be necessary. Maybe we need to look for the other worlds in the solar system that could also host life. We just haven't found it yet. Of course, we want to find humans and advanced life like us, then we probably do need an Earth-like world with nice water at the surface. But that probably exists out there. I can't imagine why it wouldn't, because there's so many stars out there with so many planets around them. I just think it's got to have existed somewhere else. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And, um, it certainly sort of makes you optimistic for sort of future space exploration and exoplanet study, doesn't it? You know, the, the, the future looks bright for sort of uh, astrovolcanism, would you say? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think we're just, you know, as, as our technology improves and we get build better telescopes that get further into deep space to analyse things, then yes, we're sure we're, we're going to find so much more out there. I think we'll find Earth-like worlds, but we're definitely going to find activity um, planets and moons with atmospheres, which again is probably quite a, a huge requirement for life. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot more to come. Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks very much for speaking to me today, Natalie, and uh, good luck with the book when it comes out. And it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating read. And yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Mm-hmm.